and I too am a church planting wife. My husband Kyle and I planted a church in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2008. And I wanna share with you some things that have become anchors for me in church planting and in ministry because I want you to thrive in this role that God has called you to. A lot of times ministry feels like we're a boat in a rocking ocean and, and sometimes the waves are really, really strong and we're up and down and up and down. And so we do need these types of anchors to, to hold us, to anchor us in our ministry. And so I wanna share with you six anchors that have held me in my church planting journey. The first one is I am not the Christ. And that wording you might recognize from John the Baptist, that there were many people coming to him and saying, who are you? And trying to label him and trying to form him into who they wanted him to be. And he would always say, I am not the Christ. I shine a light on the light of the world. I am a groomsman that stands with the groom, but I am not him. I am not the Christ. A lot of times in our ministry, we feel the expectations of other people, that they, they wanna mold us into who they want us to be. And sometimes they wanna elevate us, just as people did with John the Baptist. They were upset that his disciples were leaving and going to Jesus, and they wanna elevate us to a, a, a pedestal. And so going back to this anchor for me has reminded me, I am not the Christ. Just like John the Baptist, he had a very specific ministry to a specific people at a specific time and in a specific context. He was called to make straight the way of the Lord. And so I think about that for myself. I'm called to this specific people at this specific time. And I have a specific gift that he wants to use among these people, but I am not the Christ. That job belongs to Jesus Christ. And so I wanna reflect back to him. I wanna point people to him, not to myself, and not to allow their expectations of me to make me more than what I am intended to be. That's anchor number one. Anchor number two is that I am to have the mindset of Jesus, a suffering servant. Jesus was a suffering servant. I always go back to Philippians 2 and think about what he did and how he served. So I'm gonna confess that when I started in ministry, I thought that it was gonna be a little bit glamorous I thought that people would honor me and that they would follow me and that they would think that I was something special, which is kind of icky to say out loud. But I quickly realized that ministry is not that. Ministry is being a servant like Jesus. And so when I think about what he has said about service, I think about where Paul says, Jesus said, it was better to give than to receive. Now, he's saying that there is a joy that we have in being a servant. Have you ever had a time where you got to spend time with someone in conversation, maybe after church, and they were very discouraged, and you got to encourage them, and you knew that the Spirit was using you to speak a word of encouragement to them? You leave that time, and you if you were to think about it, you would realize they didn't ask anything about you. They didn't return the encouragement to you, but you felt joy because you had been used to be a blessing and that in return had blessed you. That's the specific joy that we have in imitating Jesus, the suffering servant. Anchor number three that has carried me in church planting and ministry is that I must receive the care of the Lord. Now, if you're in ministry for very long, church planting especially, you look around at some point and go, who's Who's caring for me? Where do I go when I have a need? There's so many needs and I don't know where I go with mine. I have done that countless times. And every single time the Lord reminds me that he does care for me in very specific ways. It may not be the way that I imagine and envision it should be, but he is caring for me every single day. The first way he does that is through his word. I can meet with him every single day and be refreshed and reminded of gospel truths. He is caring for me in his word, but he also wants to care for me through rest, through a Sabbath rest, taking time away from activity to simply abide with him. 
He wants to care for me in that. He wants to renew me in that. He also wants to care for me through relationships. And it's important for me that I'm cultivating not just ministry relationships, but friendships that feel life-giving to me. There are many ways that he cares for us. Physical activity, through our marriage relationship, through prayer of the saints. But I just want to talk for a second about the church itself. The church is the way that God cares for us. And this is where we often have this picture in our minds of what we think that should look like. And I certainly have that. And every time I have that little pity party, you know, I'm setting up chairs at church or I'm tearing down afterward and I'm thinking, Who, who's thinking about me? Well, God has taught me in those moments to remember who has cared for me specifically that day at church, that I have come to church and if I didn't set up the chair, someone set it up for me. If I'm not standing at the door greeting, someone is doing that to me, greeting me. My husband is preaching the word, a feast for my soul. The worship leader is leading me to worship God. When my children were small, I had people who were caring for them on Sunday mornings and teaching them and discipling them. The prayer team showed up early to pray, to pray for the service of which I am a part. And so the church is caring for us. And when we think of it like that, we can, it, it causes us to be thankful, to be thankful that he does care for us. The fourth anchor that I want to share with you is that I am called to be faithful in my life not in anyone else's life. And this really comes into play as your church plant grows and you add more people to the mix, whether they're volunteers or other staff or elders. What happened for me when, that began, when we began to grow as a church is I started looking around at these other women and comparing myself with them. Sometimes, to be honest, I would look at them and think, well, they don't do things the way that I would. And, and sometimes I would think, well, Wow, they're really good at that, and I'm not, and I should be good at that. And I remember at the time reading Romans 14 and God just using that to show me that there is not meant to be uniformity in the body. There is to be unity, but not uniformity. And so I, like we talked about with John the Baptist, I need to know what my calling is and do that. But then look at other women around me who are using their gifts in serving and champion that. So Romans 14, it says that we're going to give an account to God and that, that we are accountable to him for ourselves, not for other people, but also that we should seek the mutual upbuilding of one another. And so what that means and what that anchor for me is, is that I, if I notice something about someone else and how God is using them, Instead of letting that be a condemnation on me, I'm going to acknowledge that to them. I'm going to celebrate that in them. And I'm going to encourage them to, to, to continue in that way and to celebrate that uniformity is not the goal, but unity is. Okay, anchor number five, and this is a big one. In ministry and church planting, I am to have the mindset of Jesus by entrusting myself to the just Judge. Now, this is where we talk about hurt because we will be hurt and we will hurt others. And so what do we do with that hurt? I, I, there have been times where I've experienced hurt that I could not share with anyone else besides my husband. And it's a heavy weight that we carry. What do we do when we've been wounded? How do we forgive those things? And what has become important to me is 1 Peter 2, 19 through 23. And I want to read this to you because I'm asking us to have the mindset of Jesus. And this was his mindset. It says, for this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 
And so what he's saying there is sometimes we are gonna suffer unjustly. There may be times where your husband makes a decision, he has all of the information, and someone who has half of the information gets very upset and maybe even vocally upset in the church community. That's suffering unjustly. Now, we don't always suffer unjustly, and we need to be ready to receive correction. If someone comes to us and says, you've hurt me, we need to definitely keep that on our radar that sometimes we suffer justly. We have done something to sin against someone else. We wanna be ready to receive and respond to that correction. But Peter is talking about suffering unjustly as Jesus did, and he gives us an example to follow. He entrusted himself to the just judge. So God used this verse specifically in my life when I realized someone had wounded me and instead of forgiving, I had let bitterness fester and unforgiveness fester. And God showed me that he sees all. And that includes me and my response to, to being wounded. It's up to me to forgive as he's forgiven me and then to entrust that person in that situation to God who sees all and will deal with it perfectly and justly. So that gives us a good framework for moving through difficulty in church planting. The last anchor is, uh, this is a huge anchoring truth for me, is that it is God's will for me and for you to be thankful. And, and we know that from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That means in church planting, he is asking us to be thankful. And one practical way that, that I try to do this, and, and it is a practice and a discipline to be thankful, to choose to be thankful. One, one thing that often happens in church planting is that we become so burdened with all the issues and the problems and how's this gonna work and are we gonna ever get there? And you know we have these goals and will we reach them? And so you can just be bogged down by all the problems and discouragement. And a lot of times what we find is when we leave town, some of that kind of rises off our shoulders and we can see the horizon and we can see the big picture. And what happens is we start thinking about all the ways God has provided, what he has done. And at some point when Kyle and I realized this, we said we're gonna have to be intentional about talking about the wins. That's what we call it, counting the wins. The reason why it's sometimes difficult to do that is because the wins in church planting are often small and subtle. So the first time that a family in Virginia asked us to come to their house for dinner, that's a win. We celebrated that win. And we've had to be intentional about counting those up and reminding ourselves that God has been faithful, that he is at work. And it leads to worship. It leads to thanksgiving. And it leads to just a really fun conversation between my husband and I. It helps us to endure in ministry. So those are my anchors, my six anchors that hold me as the waves of church planting and ministry, they, they toss us around. We do have truths from scripture that hold us. Church planting wife, I am for you, and I pray that you will be enabled and empowered by God's spirit to fulfill this calling that he's placed on your life.